I had actually told Jan and Heather, my wife and daughter, that I was sorry and told them I didn't think we were going to make it. I told them I loved them and then pushed the nose of the plane down into the canyon to try and keep flying it so it wouldn't stall. Episode 336, a story of a plane crash and survival in the Idaho mountains, a holiday flashback with Brian Brown. You're listening to the Adventure Sports Podcast, brought to you by 180 Tech. We talk with adventurers from around the globe to bring you the inspiration and motivation you need to get started in the outdoors or to keep you moving if you're already there. Hey guys, Happy New Year. Kurt and I want to say thank you for listening to the Adventure Sports Podcast over the couple of years we've been doing this. We hope you guys are enjoying your friends and family today. We've got one more holiday flashback for you, and then we'll be back on Thursday with Josh Schaus to talk about cave diving. Be safe, have fun, and we'll see you on Thursday. Hi, and welcome back to another episode of the Adventure Sports Podcast. This is Travis. So today on the line with me is Brian Brown. Brian is a pilot and a retired captain of the fire department. Um, The show today is going to be on Brian's experience uh, flying. But the kicker here is that Brian was involved with a plane crash in the mountains in Idaho. And he had written a book about it. Uh, The book is called Rescued, One Family's Miraculous Story of Survival. And it really is a pretty uh, crazy story and one that you guys will definitely enjoy. So, Brian, let's jump into it. Welcome to the show. Uh, thank you for having me. Yeah, good to have you. Yeah, glad to glad to share our experience. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, I'm glad you're around to share it with us. <laughs> okay, so let's jump in a little bit. We like to get a little bit of background on our guests. Um, I understand you've been flying for quite some time. You started uh, flying at 16? Yeah, I actually started at 16 years old. Uh, it was kind of interesting. My, my sister used to play uh, softball and Right next to the softball diamond, there was an airport uh, in the little town of Real Linda where we lived. And uh, so I would sit there and watch her play softball. But in fact, I really watched a lot of times the airplanes flying overhead, getting ready to land at the little airport uh, right next door. And I was probably actually only around uh, 10 years old then. And at that time, my dad was still an active pilot. And um, he, he actually took me over to the airport at the end of one of the softball games and it, you know, paid for one of those introductory flights, you know, for, uh, I don't know how much it was back then, but anyway, it was for about a half hour. And uh, the pilot let me take the controls. And I'll tell you, from that point, I was hooked. And, yeah, and it, it, it just didn't take much else to to keep me from from wanting to do that at that point. <laughs> uh, such an amazing experience for your first time, isn't it? Oh, yeah. And, you know, especially at the too, I just was, <laughs> I was just excited out of my skin, you know. <laughs> Yeah, when you get up there and you in the the pilot says take the controls, you're kind of thinking, what you know, what, <laughs> why why would I take the controls there? Are you sure you want to trust me with this plane? But I mean, just to keep a, a small plane like that level in flight uh, is obviously a, a simple task, and you have somebody there backing you up. But it's such an amazing experience to be able to grab those controls and and take flight for the first time. Cause it's something that so many people don't get to uh, to feel for themselves. Oh, absolutely. And, you know, I try and do that still today is, is, you know, when I'm flying and I take somebody up, I'll, I'll let them take the controls. And like you said, there, in most planes, there's actually a set of controls on both seats. So, you know, there's the pilot can always totally take over the airplane at any point in time. So it's, there's never really any hazards. <laughs> so that was when you were young at 16 years old. And I understand it took you a little while to be able uh, to become a private pilot to get your license. Um, had you just kind of flown off and on leading up to that? What took so long to actually do the to get your license? Oh, that's exactly right. You know, it's 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 kind of expensive. And um, so, I mean, it's it's a hobby. If you know you want to get into it, you need to make sure you want to stick in it. It's because it's, you will spend some money to to get started. And that's exactly my case. You know, I started at 16 and and was going at a pretty good rate. And then, um, you know, I was actually paying for it all myself. My my folks didn't pay for it. I had to pay for it out of my own pocket, which made it a little bit harder. And um, you, you can't at that point, you couldn't actually have your license until you were 18. 
And I actually I got, ended up getting married at a very young age at 18 years old. And there you can kind of tell where my finances went at that point. <laughs> <laughs> they get refocused, don't they? <laughs> exactly. You know, so I, you know, I had to stop flying for a while then. And then I actually started back up again uh, in my 20s. And, you know, same thing was just kind of chipping away at my license. And it was just very difficult finance wise to to keep going. But again, I had enough of a drive to keep doing it uh, all the way up until a little bit before my uh, I was in my late 30s. And then my wife had actually uh, for one Christmas had just handed me, you know, a fairly good sized check and said, you need to finish your flying. You've wanted to do this your whole life. And uh, so, I mean, she she essentially just financed, you know, had pocketed money away and financed the rest of it and got helped me get my license done. Oh, that's such a sweet present. That's amazing. <laughs> well, yeah, it really was. And then, you know, it didn't stop there on my 40th birthday. She, she bought me my first airplane. So, wow. Yeah. <laughs> and I always, you know, I do a lot of speaking engagements actually for flight safety now. And, and I'll, I'll usually kind of start off with that when I inter- introduce my wife in the whole story. And, you know, the very first question is, is wow, does she have a sister? <laughs> yeah. it, you know because it's it everybody knows it is pretty expensive uh of, of a hobby to do it and then to have a spouse that's that supportive is is almost unheard of you know so she's really been awesome wow that's great that's amazing all right so you finally end up getting your your pilot's license after all that i can understand it is cost prohibitive and like you said if you're wanting to dabble in it you really need to either decide whether you're going to jump in the pool or stay out of the pool because it's not something you take lightly you don't just uh you know get a pilot's license and maybe go rent a plane every 3 months when you can afford it it's just not worth it at that point so you dive in right. with both feet at that point right Okay. So you get your pilot's license and you had been flying for, I believe, about 10 years prior to the incident we're going to talk about. Is that correct? Yes. Okay. All right. So let's go into it. Um, you guys uh, live in California and you were going to be getting on your airplane uh, Memorial Day weekend, 2012, and heading uh, with your wife and your youngest daughter to go see your oldest daughter in Mountain Home, Idaho. So uh, tell us how what it is you were going to be doing and then walk us through the the stages of this trip that led up to the event yeah this that's exactly right we were we were flying out to see our oldest daughter tabitha in mountain home and you know this trip is is equal to i would say you know basically getting in your car and taking a four-hour drive to a to an amusement park or something like that it's you know it's it's about a a four-hour flight and it really should have been pretty routine um we had started off that day. We had perfect weather. Um, I did get a, a weather report before we took off. And, you know, so I actually knew there was some weather hanging around the, uh, the Owyhee mountain range, which is, um, it sounds like Hawaii, but it's Owyhee, um, mountains in Idaho. And they kind of border the Oregon and Idaho, um, state line. Uh, they're, and they're real similar to the Sierra Nevadas in California. Um, so I knew I had mountain ranges to go over. And I, I did know that there was weather kind of hovering over the Owyhee Mountains, uh, but it was also reported to be moving um, towards the east. And then, you know, with my thinking, I thought, well, that's that's actually perfect. We're heading east. By the time we get there, it'll be gone. And at the rate it was moving, that should have been the case. Um, as, as we progressed through that flight, um, we actually did start to see some weather over the Sierra Nevadas um, enough to where I felt like we needed to, and we needed to stop anyway for a, a fuel stop and bathroom break at, at um, Sierraville, or sc- excuse me, Susanville, uh, which is just on the other side of the Sierra Nevada mountains. And so we did make that stop and uh, got the weather report, and the weather was still reporting the same thing, that there was weather over the Owyhee Mountains. And uh, so I decided that we'd just actually borrow a car at the airport and drive into town at Susanville and just, you know, we'll get lunch and we'll just make that st- stay a little bit longer than what we had anticipated. Now, I want to point out, you so guys were flying uh, VFR, which is visual flight rules. So you didn't have the instruments, the weather instruments that we would think about on larger aircraft to be able to see the storms and navigate through uh, something that you can't see through, right? Absolutely right. Yeah. You know, sorry for leaving that out. Yes, I uh, VFR pilot. And so, yeah, I was fly- flying visual only. And um, so, yeah, I, I absolutely had to have visual um, rules and visual guidelines to be able to continue the flight. And um, 
so with with all that information, um, I never did fall out of that um, the visual flight rules, uh, but but we were right at that that edge really. Uh, we ended up staying, like I said, for lunch and and a little bit of a bathroom break, and definitely um, stuck around quite a bit longer, about an hour longer in Susanville, waiting for the weather to actually change our direction. And uh, it finally did. Uh, we we took off again and headed for um, pretty much direct for Mountain Home, Idaho. And as we got uh, probably about 30 to 45 minutes from uh, Mountain Home, I could see that weather out there. Um, it still hadn't really moved as far as, as I'd hoped, but it wasn't really producing any rain. Uh, so, I, you know, my thought was, well, I'll stay visual. I'll go underneath it, you know, underneath the weather and we'll just, we don't have that much further to go. We should be fine. And so we had progressed on, uh, we got past the weather front or into across the weather front and it started raining so hard. I actually couldn't see through the windshield. And, uh, so at that point it was very obvious I couldn't continue forward. So I made, you know, an abrupt 180 degree turn to get out of the weather and then hit my, my GPS unit has a, a direct two button, which kind of gives the five closest airports to me. And the closest one it gave was, uh, Rome state. And, uh, it, Basically, it had said, you know, Rome State, Oregon was the closest and that it had some facilities. So it means, you know, it should have a building, should have, you know, bathrooms, stuff like that. And I thought, OK, perfect. And so we headed for Rome State. And uh, when I got over the top of Rome State, I looked down and just thought, you've got to be kidding me. You know, I circled over the top of it a couple of times to assess it. And it actually is just large uh, abandoned World War II gravel runway that's <laughs> out in the middle of nowhere. I mean, there's the closest town is about 35, 40 miles away. There's no buildings, no nothing. And, uh, you know, I think that with the exception maybe of an errant coyote or something that was out in the field. And uh, I ended up putting the plane down there anyway, just because at this point it was like, you know, it's, it's better to be on the ground and not safe than, than up there in the weather. So I put the plane down pretty gently there on the gravel runway. And, and it did actually have a sign that said, welcome to Rome State, you know, in a, in a chain tie down, you know, to keep your plane from uh, flipping over in, in rough weather. <laughs> this is nothing uh, but a dirt strip with a couple of stakes in the ground. Yeah, essentially that was it. And, <laughs> and, and, and it did at least have a welcoming sign, Travis, you know, it, you know, welcome to Rome State. So, you know, it gave me a little bit of a warm feeling, at least when we got there. Right. Uh, but again, you know, that's, that was where we were. And uh, I told the girls at that point too, and, you know, and actually at that point, you know, cell phone service, none of that stuff was is working very well there because we're we're pretty much out in the middle of nowhere between Oregon and Idaho and California area. And it's just uh, like I said cell phone service is, is worse than than sparse. And I told the girls that we're probably going to end up staying there the night, you know, because I didn't know if the weather would change well enough for us to continue on with the flight. And. You know, we'd already burned a lot of day over at, at um, Susanville. And so, you know, again, I went the whole process. The girls had asked me, well, what's it going to take to continue? And I said, well, I have to have daylight. I have to have no weather. And, I, you know, I really need to be able to see. Um, I have to have enough time of daylight to be able to get over the Owyhee Mountains. I have right. to be able to see them. And I spent time, um, you know, recalculating things with my maps and, and navigational tools and and then, you know, that's when the next kind of crazy thing happened, you know, to me, I mean, I describe it now, like, you know, you hear on TV where the cherubs start singing, you know, the, ah, and the, <laughs> the, 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 the sky opens up and it was, it, it just opened up perfectly for us right at the time frame that I needed to have enough daylight to make it over the Owyhee mountains. And I looked the direction we were going, it looked perfectly clear and good to go. And so I said, we're going to, we're going to try and make this last hop. And so we took off and we started flying uh, towards the Owyhees and we got through the Owyhees a uh, pretty good distance. And then uh, the weather just started to form right in front of us. Oh. And uh, yeah, I mean, I literally, I saw some, some, th some thunderheads essentially start building and forming right in front of me at rapid rate. I, I veered off my course a little bit to stay out of them. And right when I did that, I had more building in the next new course that I had set. And at that point, I knew I needed to turn around again. And so when I looked around to to, to turn back uh, to Rome, we were already closed in by all the weather. So it just wrapped around you. It formed in front, and then it snuck in behind you at the same time. That's got to be exactly. completely disheartening. Yeah, it was. And, uh, I mean, it was the very, very worst place in the world I could have put myself. 
Um, so, you know, I'm, I'm really only about a thousand feet above the terrain. And so I'm just under the weather and just above the terrain and really the worst place in the world you can be while you're mountain flying. Right. And I uh, found myself just the busiest I'd ever been as a pilot too. I'm, you know, I'm scanning instruments, I'm scanning weather, I'm scanning the terrain, I'm, you know, settling my wife and daughter because it's also pretty bumpy at this point too. And that's when, uh, finally in one of my scans, uh, I, I was watching and, and we were coming over a ridgeline. I saw our airspeed go from 110 down to 40 just in the snap of a finger. And at my plane, you know, that 172 needed at least about 50 to 55 uh, miles an hour to fly. And we, you know, we'd gone well past that. And again, that's not uncommon in mountain flying to actually see a drop like that. But normally it'll slowly kind of re- come back and recover. And, and in this case, it didn't. And when it did that, I actually, uh, this is what, what gets a lot of people and it still even gets me when I say it, but I, I had actually told Jan and Heather, my wife and daughter that I was sorry and told them I didn't think we were going to make it. I told them I loved them and then pushed the nose of the plane down into the canyon to try and keep flying it. So it wouldn't stall. Wow. I cannot imagine having that go through my head and actually coming to the point where I felt like I needed to say that out loud. Yeah, it. You know, and actually, even before that, uh, JN had actually said a prayer out loud. This changed my life as a Christian man, I tell you. I bet. Um, but, you know, she had said a prayer out loud that was, you know, something to the effect of, you know, God is a lot scarier than we thought. You know, please put your angels on our wings and, and carry us through this. And we all said out, out you know, amen to that out, out loud. And, but, you know, like I said, when, when I was scanning everything, I knew there was no good place to put the airplane down if we hadn't any, any kind of tr- trouble. I mean, I well ahead of time and just with the condition we were at that moment i knew that too um right when i had my my airspeed drop and um so anyway when i plunged that nose of the plane down um right before we hit the bottom i actually got control back i could feel control back in the in the yoke and it pulled it back as far as i could and so the, the nose flared pretty steep up we were trying to fly back out of the canyon and i hit two trees with the wingtips and then smacked the belly first into the next mountainside um for for two of us you know for jan and i actually uh, we went unconscious pretty quick uh for i ended up hitting the windshield and actually going through the windshield a little bit and uh, jan hit the kind of the doorpost of the of the airplane was on the impact, it ripped the door off on her side, and she hit the part of the windshield and the doorpost, and then fell back into into her seat. Um, and it, according to Heather, my daughter that was in the back seat, you know, she said that I was only out for probably only like two or three seconds. I mean, it's just more of a daze than a true knockout. And I do remember, you know, kind of opening my eyes, shaking my head a little bit. And my first thought was, "Wow." you know, we're still alive. I mean, I, I couldn't believe it. Um, cause I just, pilots don't survive mountain plane crashes, you know, and, and here we were, you know, I, I thought, wow, I couldn't believe it. And then in that very next deal, I could hear Heather screaming for her mom. And when I looked over at JN, JN was just hanging lip, limp, like a rag doll, basically seatbelt was the only thing holding her in the airplane. And, uh, I tell you, my, my first thought was, I thought, oh shoot, I, I've just killed JN. Right. And uh, at that point, you know, my professional rescuer part just kicked in and I, I grabbed JN, pulled her back into the airplane and, you know, held her head in line to open her airway and uh, was calling to her, trying to get her to, to you know, breathe and, and all that sort of stuff. And I was one of the most horrific sights I've seen. You know, I've seen it several times during my career, but when it's your own wife, it's it's a lot different. Mm. Uh, I just didn't think she was going to make it. And then uh, after about probably 35, 45 seconds, she finally, her eyes kind of fluttered open. She took a big gasp of air and she said, I'm here. I'm still with you. And, you know, what a huge sigh of relief. <laughs> yeah, that's an understatement. <laughs> yeah. And, um, you know, I, I kind of got her stable. I actually ended up picking her up and putting her into my my seat in the airplane because it was a lot, a lot more stable. And then I went back and started checking on Heather to make she, sure she was okay. And she was pretty bumped and bruised. Um, she actually hurt bad enough to where I thought she might have actually fractured her hip. Um, but she was a trooper. I mean, that that gal was just uh, something else. And at the time, you know, she was 26 years old. So, I mean, young woman, but still, I mean, she really held it together based on everything she had seen and what she had gone through. 
And at that point, she was actually helping me gather stuff together, you know, extra clothes and things that um, we actually could reach because most of most of the plane's contents slid deep into the tail cone of the aircraft. So most of the stuff was really tough to retrieve. Um, but one of the most key things she got was my portable aviation radio. And, um, you know, I was able to turn that on and check to make sure that my emergency beacon was working. And, you know, thankfully it was. And uh, from that point, then I just, I got out of the plane, made sure it was stable and that it wasn't going to slide down the mountain anymore. And then uh, made a decision that wasn't real popular with Heather. Um, at this point, JN, actually JN doesn't remember a lot of the crash. Uh, and she was out of it that, that evening, but uh, what I told Heather was that I was going to try and hike up the mountain about 300 yards and try and transmit a mayday with my radio. And based on how I looked and, you know, I didn't know how bad I'd, I'd actually looked, but um, she just had nothing to do with that. She says, you're, you're not going to make it back. You know, you can't do that. And uh, I argued with her to the point where it was like, you know, I got to try. And I did end up trying to transmit that mayday with, with um, obviously with no success. And, uh, during that time, <laughs> climbing up the mountain uh, and trying to transmit that mayday, our, our situation got a little bit worse. It started snowing. It's official. Winter has arrived and Bent Gate Mountaineering is prepared to help you get ready for your epic winter. Come check out the latest in Alpine Touring, Telemark, NTN, and Splitboarding gear. They have brands like Black Crows, DPS, Dinafit, G3, Icelandic, K2, Technica Blizzard, Arcteryx, Mammoth, Solomon, Vole, Never Summer, Jones, and BCA. And you do need to be safe out there. Bentgate has the latest in avalanche safety gear. They have beacons, airbags, shovels, and probes, and they're ready to help you educate yourself on snow safety. They also rent out gear, so you can get your skis and your boots there, as well as your avalanche safety equipment. What's more, they also have free demo ski days at local resorts, so you can try out the latest gear. Now, how much fun does that sound? So swing by Bent Gate in Golden, Colorado, or go to BentGate.com to find your new gear, as well as to get updates on all of their events. The 180 Flame is the ideal alternative to bulky and fragile gas-burning camp stoves. The 180 Flame utilizes fewer parts with minimal weight and maximized reliability. The locking tab and slot design means there are no hinges, welds, or rivets to fail you in the field. Cook your food and boil water quickly using only small amounts of natural fuels including twigs, grass, pine cones, and leaves. Weighing just 6.4 ounces, the 180 Flame is the ideal alternative to a backpacking stove. You can find your new Flame at 180tac.com or a retailer near you. 180 Flame. Think big, pack small. Now I'm I'm kind of thinking, okay, now I've got to try and keep us warm. So I started dragging, you know, wood back down towards the airplane to try and build a fire for us and, you know, be able to keep us warm because I had no idea how long um, our rescue would be. And, uh, well, and you guys they, were in pretty light clothing. You had left a warm climate in California <laughs> expecting to land in a, a pretty warm climate in a mountain home. So you weren't dressed you know, for the, the snowy mountains that you ended up crashing in. No, we really weren't. You know, and I was probably dressed the warmest. I had jeans on and I had two shirt layers on. Um, but the girls, you know, you're right. They were dressed like California girls, you know, capri pants. So very thin pants, you know, short legged uh, with sandals and thin blouses on. And, um, you know, Heather had a black a pillow that she always tra traveled with. So we had that, too. Uh, and then whatever uh, clothes Heather was able to, you know, get that didn't slide deep into the tail cone, she actually put all those on. Um, but we were, yeah, we were dressed pretty thin. We were dressed like Californians and, uh, you know, something if if I could do it all over again, I'd definitely have done something different there. <laughs> yeah. Well, you talk about things sliding into the tail cone and, you know, I think the, the first thought would be like, well, you have luggage with you and everything, right? But... But if you imagine a plane, I mean, you have the cockpit of a plane, and, and you had mentioned the 172. So you were flying a Cessna 172, which is essentially the, 
the Chevy Nova. <laughs> I think I just dated myself, but it's the Chevy Nova or the Honda Civic <laughs> of airplanes. I mean, if you live in a local, uh, live near a local airport and there's a plane going overhead and you look up, there's probably about a 50% chance it's a Cessna 172. It's probably the, the most common, uh, high wing single engine aircraft out there, right? Very right. Very right. Yes. Yeah. And they're, you know, they, it's designed to be a four seat aircraft, but I'll, you know, honestly, it's, it's really, uh, a three adult at maximum, you know, aircraft and virtually no luggage. And even with that type of flight, um, matter of fact, I don't, I wouldn't make that flight again with that kind of an airplane, but uh, you know, it, it, it was very, very limited for that task that I put it on that day. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, so very, very small really. And just not a lot of room for a lot of luggage, which was, you know, part of the issue too, because we did have three adults, I wasn't full of fuel the whole, the whole time, you know, I was managing that in the weight part of the aspect of things. And I also told the girls, you know, we have one duffel bag, we're going to, we're going to get all the clothes we can in the one duffel bag just for the, basically it was for an overnight stay. Um, so we really didn't need a lot of clothes. And, um, so anyway, I, yeah, I had them, uh, pack as light as possible. We just, we just really didn't have that much. Uh, the blanket and the pillow that Heather had was was really the godsend um, because with all the clothes that Heather put on, uh, she actually took the pillow and you know took it apart, put the the pillow case over her legs, and then bear hugged the rest of the pillow. And with a lot of argument too, um, she actually she she ended up giving the blanket to us, and we kept arguing, saying no, you take it, and she could see that we were hurt a lot worse, and and made us take it. Um, you, you know, and the other part where she was just such a trooper was uh you know i knew we both had head injuries that jan and i did and i asked heather to actually do a roll call about every 10 minutes throughout the night um you know to call our name out and make sure we didn't fall asleep uh because my fear was our head injuries were so bad if we fell asleep we wouldn't wake back up and then on top of that we were we were all dealing with hypothermia too at this point with the snow and um i actually um, had a little bit of success with the fire, but not to, not to the success I would have liked. Um, and there's, there's an interesting story about that in the book. Um, not one I'm overly proud of as a career fireman, but anyway, <laughs> uh, yeah, it, it just, it was a real challenge to try and keep us going throughout the rest of the night. And, uh, so then, you know, with that roll call going on, you know, we crashed it at about nine o'clock. So it was right when the sun was, was just starting to go down and uh or a little bit before nine and then uh so this roll call went on from basically nine o'clock until about midnight and this is when the most real real miraculous thing happened so it's cold cold quiet and just just dark in the mountains and out of that dead silence one of our cell phones started ringing now you know i i live in kind of a remote area area here in california and my cell phone service isn't that great as a matter of fact, you know, when I sit in my living room, I'm lucky to get a cell phone call out in, in my recliner. But we were deep, deep in the mountain canyon in Idaho in a snowstorm. And you know, phones weren't working anywhere else, but, but it happened to manage to work enough to get a phone call. And it really shocked us. You know, we probably sucked all the air out of the cockpit, you know, when we gasped when we heard the phone. <laughs> what is that noise? I was not expecting that. <laughs> yeah. And it, it happened to be Tabitha. You know, she was trying to find out why we hadn't made the de destination yet. And of course, we didn't know that at the time. We we knew that later, but in in that that phone call and the the stir, Heather was able to the phone lit up the the cockpit. You know, the face of the phone did, and Heather was able to dive down into the floorboard of the wreckage and find find the phone because, in fact, we didn't even know we had them any, anymore. You know, everything went strewn all over the place, and mm -hmm. uh, so Heather was able to find that phone and and my phone. And uh, it's kind of a cute part of the the whole thing is both Jan and I, you know. A little bit of our, we tell Heather, you know, we'll call Tabitha back and have her call nine one one, and Heather's looking at us, you know, the heck with that, I'm going to call nine one one myself, you know, and bless her heart, you know, she did, um, she she waved the phones around kind of like a cheerleader trying to get signals on them because they didn't have any signals, and uh, she was able to get a signal enough to to dial nine one one and get it to connect, and uh, I'll never forget that. You know, and and hearing the dispatcher's voice over the speakerphone on on that phone, uh, saying this is a Y.A. County nine one one what emergency, and um, 
like I said, talk about a warming feeling. You know, it didn't matter how cold we were. That one, that one warmed me right up. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I'll bet. And, uh, you know, we were able to get enough information for her uh, that, you know, basically the, we had crashed where we had started our flight from and where we were headed to. We had no real good idea where we were at that point because, you know, I veered my course a little bit from the storm. And uh, but we were able to get who we were and about about where we were. And then our phone call dropped. And uh, so it, it kind of went that way again with Heather doing the roll call and all that sort of stuff went on for for the rest of the night. But it did happen to be about an, another 45 minutes later, we were able to make their connection into one and they were able to ping our phone. Uh, so it was able to kind of central centralize a little bit, you know, got them down to about a five mile radius of where we actually were. Mm hmm. And which, which really, again, helped, helped the search part of the, the whole thing. And, uh, but at, at this point too, uh, she was, the dispatcher was able to launch helicopters. We could hear them flying overhead. Um, they were flying in near whiteout conditions. I mean, it, it's snowing that bad. And at one point too, I could hear them. And I, my first thought was, Oh, I can talk to them with my portable radio. So I had the radio down at my feet. And, um, between the last time I had done a battery change, and how cold it had gotten that night, the batteries basically were dead in the radio. Yeah, yeah. unfortunately that happens. Uh, our batteries get cold. Well, it's a good point um, about calling 911 from the phone on, you know, at the scene. Because, you know, like you found out, had you called her sister and had her report it, she wouldn't have been able to tell them, you know, any, remotely where you guys were. But the fact that you guys dialed from a from a cell phone on that location, they were able to uh, triangulate you at the time. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. And it, it was just amazing that it all even worked. I mean, it, 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 there was really no, to me, there's no earthly explanation why our, our cell phones worked there because they didn't work anymore after that. And, you know, I joke about it, if they'd worked that well, I'd have been ordering hot chocolate and blankets, you know, and rescuers, <laughs> but right. it just wasn't working that way. And uh, so, I mean, it, it went on like that until, basically about five o'clock, five thirty the next morning. And then I could hear helicopters flying over overhead again. And so I told the girls I'd go back out and try and light the signal fire one more time. And right when I reached down to light the signal fire, the helicopter flew right over the top of us. Wow. And yeah, and so I didn't get the fire lit fast enough and he, he truly didn't see me. So I reached grabbed my phone and I turned the camera flash on and I started flashing him with the camera flash. And um he actually did get a glimpse of that and I didn't realize it, but he'd, he'd come back around for a second look and I or switched it to um, switched my phone to that flashlight app, you know, that has a strobe light on it. Right. And uh, was waving that back and forth and, and he was able to spot that. And that's when I finally saw him go into a hover. And wow, that was uh, a great knew, idea. Knew that we, yeah. knew that we were rescued at that, that point. And man, again, it, at the, at the point he went into that hover, it, it just dropped me to my knees. I was just, so relieved, you know, that I knew that, you know, hey, we've, we've been found, we're, we're going to survive this. And, and it was just, uh, it was just really something. And, you know, a lot of other things kind of happened in between, you know, what, what I've already told you. And, you know, I mean, it'd take me hours to tell you this whole story. It's why we, it's why I wrote the book. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <laughs> no doubt. Well, and to remind our listeners, the book is uh, named Rescued, One Family's Miraculous Story of Survival. So if you want to hear more of this story uh, in detail, certainly go check out his book. We put that in our uh, ASP bookshelf for you guys, uh, as well as the show notes. So you guys are sitting in the in the, the snow-covered mountains at this point in a crumpled up plane, and the helicopter finally... Uh, finds you. And I know that I think you guys had other rescue crews coming in uh, on foot and, yes. and four by four. Um, but there was obviously you're going to take them a while to get there. So the fact that they could launch a helicopter and get it out to you in, in the weather that you were uh, experiencing was uh, was pretty amazing to uh, to be able to get that yes. that quick of a rescue, I guess. Yes. Yeah. Again, another another miracle in the whole scheme of things. I mean, there were so many things that were just so, so far in our favor. There, it's just unbelievable. Unbelievable. Yeah, no doubt. So when it comes to the flight and flight plan and everything, um, I know sometimes, you know, via, on VFR, sometimes you fly, file a flight plan and sometimes you, you leave it alone. Had you guys had one at the time? 
No, you know, and see, there's there's more of the rest of the errors that I made. You know, I several things that I used to do all the time or would would do on a regular basis. One was file a flight plan, and I didn't do that on this flight. Um, I'm not really sure what made me not do it. Um, but the other was using flight following, you know, which is basically you're talking to radar con- or radio, radio controllers, tower controllers all the way through. And, you know, it's beneficial because they tell you positions of other aircraft and weather and all kinds of stuff and, and vice versa. You know, you can tell them things that you see and, and it's constant communication. And again, for whatever reason, I just didn't do that. Um, I do know that actually partially in my head, I thought, well, I always had contact with Tabitha as far as, you know, she knows when we're going to get there. So that was the flight plan part of it. But the flight following, um, I think one of the biggest reasons why I didn't on that flight is communications in general are very sparse um, through that region. And you know, I have a lot of pilot fr- friends that fly through there and they said, well, you know, not not real sure how well your radio would have worked there anyway. And that might have been part of, you know, I'd had those conversations before even that flight with with pilots and had them say that and that might have been partly what it encouraged me not to do it on that one right um yeah. not a good choice you know clearly not a good choice <laughs> yeah i wondered and, you, know, that, um, that's definitely... you know a lot of times we i think we we get into certain hobbies and and um you know careers and things that we do and there's a certain point where we become comfortable and complacent with what yep. we do and i wondered if that factored in because you had been flying Again, you know, since 16 and having your private pilot's license for 10 years before this even happened. So you were experienced, no doubt. Um, I imagine as a newer pilot, you probably did often file a flight plan. But at some point, you do become kind of complacent. You're kind of trusting yourself that, you know, that you can deal with things as they go. And uh, we can find ourselves in situations where we're thinking, man, you know, this is something I would have done, you know, as a as a newer yeah. uh, person to this hobby. And I wondered if that had factored into this decision at all. Oh, absolutely. You know, like I said, I have a pilot safety video also on the Air Safety Institute website, and we talk about all of that sort of stuff. And it is what I talk about in uh, flight safety seminars as a federal aviation safety team representative. You know, I've broken that flight down. And actually, I got to tell you, Travis, even from the moment I came to on impact, those thoughts were going through my head of, wow, why didn't I do this? Why didn't I do And, you know, it was just immediate, you know, remorse of and, you know, blaming doing you know immediately blaming myself for everything that i had done at that point and failed to do uh so very but it's it's very accurate you know some complacency and comfort over the years of, of doing flights like that had just felt like no i don't really need to do it this time and in fact you know you need to do it every time no matter how routine it is that's how i did my job no matter how routine it was i still followed the steps step by step and in this flight, I didn't, and it and it got me. Yeah, it, it always uh, it's always the one that gets you, isn't it? It's the one where you're yeah. least expecting it. Well, and um, y- you know, being in the the Idaho mountains, like we said, this is spring. We're talking about Memorial Day weekend. The uh, the mountains still had snow in them, obviously, as we're talking yeah. about snowing. Um, how were you prepared as far as survival? And I know you had a lot of experience with uh, um, ascertaining, you know, the the medical condition of people um, in your career. Right. How are you? Um, did you have survival training, or how were you prepared for that uh, physically and mentally? Well, I had a lot of training, survival, and just all kinds uh, through the fire service. I'm actually a fire master instructor, so I, I actually covered a lot of different areas of of training. And, uh, took a lot of different areas of training since I could teach it. Uh, so I had, had I had a pretty good idea of what I was doing in regards to that. Um, I took some ridicule for that, especially in the safety institute video um, that I was still prepared for it. But in fact, you know, I had some equipment, not a lot, because again, we're we're talking about a Cessna 172, and I'm trying to manage weight. Right. Um, but pretty much all of my equipment slid so deep into the tail cone I couldn't get it, and that was the frustrating part. You know, so what I've really learned out of that too is. I actually have a fishing vest that I have now that I can either wear or I can strap it right over the back of my seat and all the pockets are filled with all my survival gear. And and in fact, I actually prefer wearing it rather than slipping it over my seat because if I have to leave the aircraft, then I at least still have it. And uh, so, you know, as far as answering your question, though, I mean, I had enough knowledge to be able to keep us warm. I mean, I knew how to get a fire going. Uh, I knew how to do um 
just some basic, you know, shelter building and stuff like that if, if we'd have needed it for the long haul. And we were able to gather enough food and, and water from what was in the airplane to have kept us sustained for a while. Our, our biggest issue would have been injuries. And really the very, very biggest issue was hypothermia. Uh, that, that quite nearly killed Jan. Yeah, and I think your uh, your medical training and your in your line of work probably factored heavily into the to the survival of you guys, you know, your family out there. I think it went a long way for sure. But uh, yeah, I think it definitely helped. <laughs> <laughs> um, so normally on our show, we try to inspire people to go out and and do some of these things, but. I do like to share these things at the same time because these are things that can happen. And bringing up something like you know a bunch of your equipment getting stuffed deep down into the tail of that aircraft, that's not something you can really ever plan for. No. Um, it just it's something that happens. And you know unless you have tools to sit there and cut the aluminum siding of that that plane away, you, you couldn't have gotten you know a, a, the body width of a human back in there to retrieve it. So. Um, with all that said, and, and disaster, you know, as we're speaking of, um, what are some words of encouragement that you might have for people? We don't want to scare them away from flight. I know you're back flying. It didn't scare oh, you, you away from flight. So, so let's bring it around that way. And, you know, maybe some, uh, words of encouragement to, to go out there and start, uh, uh the hobby of flying and get your license. Oh, you bet. You know, you know, and again, we're talking about flying, um, standard aircraft, you know, there, there are other licenses out there. There's sports pilots licenses, uh, for flying stuff under a hundred horsepower. There's, there's licenses that, you know, you can fly ultralight planes. You can still get the joy of flight. Um, I mean, there are so many categories out there that aren't quite as expensive as flying, you know, the, your standard aircraft that, you know, I definitely say start there, you know, definitely start there and see if you even like, you know, getting off the ground. Some people, you know, figure it out pretty quick right from that point. Once they've left the ground, it's like, nope, don't want to do this. Um, I mean, like me with skydiving, I won't do that. My, my mind says I'm not jumping out of a perfectly good airplane. <laughs> <laughs> and unless I absolutely have to, it's just not, not, not going to happen. <laughs> but, you know, I, I do. I, I would tell people start with something more simple, like, you know, an ultralight lesson or or even a, a deal like my dad paid for me you know an intro flight and see if you like it but from that again there are just so many stages you can go and, and then um get into it slowly like that and then work your way up into into the bigger aircraft if you like because now i'm i'm flying a, a high performance complex airplane now and and i love it you know and, and actually just last year i was doing full aerobatic uh flight and unusual attitudes so you know where they're flying me upside down and all that other sort of stuff. And I absolutely love it. And even with everything that I went through, it's, it's no different than your everyday driving in a car. If you got in a car accident, I'm sure that, you know, 99% of the people would jump right back in a car and go again. Right. And, and that's what this is about too. It, you know, we had a very traumatic thing. We survived. I've learned a ton. Um, and, and I still just absolutely love the sport and, and it's a wonderful hobby. I mean, we have the ability to fly, um, you know, from one end of California to the other in just a, in just a few hours just to get a hamburger if we want to. And it's kind of neat to be able to do that, you know. And so again, that's kind of where I would say is, is start smaller. You know, if the, if the fear of the expense is there, then start in the smaller end of, of flying and, and work your way up. And, and I, I, truly think you won't be disappointed. It's it's a wonderful hobby. Yeah, it no doubt is. I had started out quite a while back uh getting my pilot's license and I had uh I had this hunch that, you know, it was around uh after 9/11 and a lot of places were uh laying laying off in 2001-2002 era and I had a hunch that I was going to get laid off, so I stopped taking flight lessons, you know, talking about being cost prohibitive like we were. Um, decided to, to pocket the cash instead of putting into flight lessons. And I'm glad I did because ultimately I got laid off. But, uh, the lessons that I did have and the experience that I did have was truly amazing. I never did quite go back to, uh, to finishing up that pilot's license. Maybe someday I will, but, but it really is an amazing, uh, hobby to get up there above the world and as congested as our world is anymore, uh, to be able to get up and have that sense of freedom and look down on it for a while is, uh, is truly amazing. I, I can't thank you for doing it. Yeah, it is a whole different perspective. 
yeah, just like you said, you, you can see congestion everywhere, and you have wide open space. Right. It's it's just just amazing and and wonderful. <laughs> so, what are some lessons learned? Um, maybe share some of these things for your new pilots. Um, like we talked about, we can we can be new to something, but then we can have experience and become complacent. Complacent, but then we can come out the backside with you know that complacency and that experience tied together to really have a, a well-rounded uh, understanding and knowledge and experience of a hobby. So now that you're kind of on this side, I mean, you've been a new pilot, you've been flying for quite a while, you've crashed a plane, you've gotten yeah. back on the horse. Um, what are some um, lessons that you've learned that you might be able to pass down to other pilots or newer pilots, uh, either from the flight perspective or preparation or even being prepared for a survival situation if if you find yourself in that situation yeah you know the um the big one like i had said i I used to do things almost by a checklist and you know pilots do do things by a checklist i i still do fly by a checklist um i was probably pretty complacent that day uh especially well not probably i definitely was complacent not using the flight plan or flight following and those are really part of the checklist and you just can't leave those things out you know it's they're there for a reason. I've actually added a personal checklist, um, and that has more to do with my overall well-being. You know, am I even feeling good that day? You know, do I have a stomach ache? Is you know, does one of my fingers hurt? Is there anything that's distracting me? You know, from my job at hand of flying this aircraft. And same with like the skill level. Even though I've got a certain amount of training, hours, all that sort of stuff, and uh, you know, when was the last time I, I flew at night? When was the last time I flew in a in a heavy wind day? You know, you keep all those things logged, and that's part of your personal well being checklist too. And if if you're outside the parameters on those, it's been probably past more than than sixty days since you've done a flight like those types. You know, high wind or night or something like that, just unusual. You probably shouldn't go. You know, you, you should probably wait and fly with an instructor in those times again, and you know, get yourself current in all of those conditions and make sure that your own personal checklist is is up to speed, you know, and, and then, so that's just you in general. I mean, again, flying just by your checklist is, is really a good, good procedure. You, you need to just stick with that. And then on the emergency aspect of things, you know, have a safety um, kit with you, you know, for first aid and for some parts of survival, just some very basic tools, but not, not just basic tools, tools that you know how to use. Uh, bless my family's heart, you know, for my birthday and Christmas over the last few years, I've got every survival gadget you could probably imagine. <laughs> I'll bet. <laughs> and, you know, some of them I opened and looked at and it's like, man, I'm not sure I know how to use this thing, you know, and, you know, and I actually I took it out and figured out how to use it. And that's what I recommend to you too. If you buy something like that, take it out, figure out how to use it. And, uh, you know, before you're in the stress, you know, when you're in the stress of that situation, that's just one more thing. Um, that you have to battle. So, you know, have some tools available, have tools that you're familiar with, actually use them and, you know, try and keep them light and keep, keep them simple inside your, your kit. And then really, I, I don't profess that I'm a, I'm an emergency medical technician, uh, through my work. Um, and yeah, I don't, I don't profess that people get that level of training if they're having their hobbies, but they should go through a burst, basic first aid, uh, training course because yeah, you're, you're, you you very well might need it and it very well may save your life. You know, just having the basic understanding of what you need to do to keep your, your people, your friends around you alive and maybe even yourself is, is a really big thing. And I know it was a big thing for us. Had I not had that training, we, I'm very confident we would have had a different outcome. Not all three of us would have made it out of the mountains. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's a good point. You know, you're not just doing these things, uh, this preparation, this training for yourself. If you ever plan on having passengers, you're really doing it for them because it's, uh, you know, that is your responsibility as the pilot yeah. for sure. You know? Yeah, and I actually learned something from the military friends of ours that that helped us in our rescue. Um, keeping a couple of items actually on your person, whether you keep it in a first aid or a kit or not, and it could be as simple as a lighter and, and a multi-tool. Uh, but if you have those with you, again, no matter what happens with you, if you get separated from the aircraft or whatever hobby it is that you're doing and or your first aid kit, if it gets separated from you, you at least have two basic tools that you can do a lot with. Yeah, absolutely. Very good point. 
Well, I'm happy that uh, you're around to sit here and tell us the story. Um, what an amazing <laughs> thing that must have been to go through, um, especially with your family. I'll bet that uh, I'll bet that has caused you guys to to hug a little bit longer and and uh, pay a little bit more of attention to oh, yeah. to your family members since then. Absolutely. Well, and like I said, it, it changed my faith. I mean, I, I believed in God before, but my faith is much stronger now. <laughs> <laughs> That'll do it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right, Brian. Well, great. Thanks so much for spending some time with me talking about this. What an amazing experience. And uh, it's, uh, it's a pleasure to, to sit here and talk to you and, and have you relive it. I'm glad that you're here and around to, to tell us about it and share some of your tips and advice with, with others as well. Oh, well, thank you, Travis. I really appreciate the opportunity. Hey, before you run off, why don't you join our Facebook group for the Adventure Sports Podcast? Just look it up. You can chime in on other people's adventures and post your own. And consider helping to support the show by becoming a patron at patreon.com slash adventure sports podcast. There's a link at the top right hand corner of our site as well. Now until the next episode, get out and have some fun.